Hi, everyone, and welcome to Digital Context webinar series. This is Mahmoud Al-Bashti from Digital Context International Academy. It's our pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Jana Rieger from Alberta, Canada. Professor Rieger will share with us her experience in applying their developed technology, mobility, as a wearable digital health technology for a swallowing disorder. Professor Jana Rieger is a global leader in functional outcome assessment related to head and neck disorders. Over her 20 years career in this field, Jana held roles as a professor, clinician, researcher, and now entrepreneur. Jana and her team developed the mobility a wearable digital health technology that delivers a proven method to, re to re regain the swallowing function for the 500 million people globally. Those people are suffering from the swallowing disorder because of the common medical disorders, such as stroke, Parkinson's disease, or head and neck cancer. In 2017, Jana spawned a company out of the University of Alberta in order to move the technology from the lab to the, into the hands of the people who need it. With her leadership, the True Angle team graduated from the Creative Destructive Laboratory, one of the most highly regarded business accelerators in Canada, and from the matter Health Accelerator in, Ch in Chicago. Over the course of her academic career, Jenna started and built several world-class programs, including an innovative health outcomes assessment program that is internationally renowned and accredited as the global standard in the field. Over the years, Jenna has been recognized as excelling in thought leadership she has functioned at a director level within the healthcare system in Alberta, mainly to bring together diverse groups of clinicians, researchers, and policymakers. In her role as CEO of True Angle, Jenna now bring her, brings her skills in funding rising, in fundraising, innovative program development international team building and thought leadership to the table to commercialize the remote digital technology that has the potential to change the lives of million people globally. Just before Jenna um, starts, I would like to raise that uh, attendees can write their questions uh, in the Q&A uh, part and later Jenna will uh, answer all these questions. So once again, um, I would like to uh, uh, thank Jenna to accept our invitation to join us. And it's a, our pleasure um, uh, to, lead, to, 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 uh, to be with us today and share with us her experience um, in the, uh, uh, their developed technology, which is called mobility. So um, Jenna. I guess the uh, stage is yours, um, please. Thanks so much, Dr. Elbashti. So I will share my screen. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, it's my pleasure to be here today to have this time to share with your viewers and listeners um, about the mobility, which is, uh, as uh, Dr. Elbashti said, a digital technology for dysphagia. Um, my background is over the past two decades, I've worked as a clinician researcher, um, primarily in an institute that worked with patients who had defects of the head and neck. So that included head and neck cancer, trauma, congenital conditions, um, and neurological conditions. Um, and it's known as the Institute for Reconstructive Sciences and Medicine. So um, through the work there, really this idea for this digital technology was born. So before I get going, I'd like to disclose that um, I am the founder of True Angle Medical Technologies, Inc. 
Um, I'm a shareholder in the company, as is the University of Alberta, and um, we are named on the patents for this uh, uh, system that we have. So I'll be talking a bit about that uh, later in the, the uh, presentation. What I'd like to go through today are four areas of discussion. So first, a little bit about dysphagia, um, talking about dysphagia as it relates to dental practices, um, looking at what's happening with uh, a digital health revolution as it applies to therapies, and then getting specifically into the mobility and um, how we're using that for remote health for patients now with dysphagia. So let's start with dysphagia and talking a bit about that. <clears throat> you know, we all love food and especially sharing food. I know that I love getting together with friends and family for dinner. Um, but what we know is that not everybody's able to enjoy this experience. And this was something that um, was really obvious when I was a clinician scientist, when I listened to patients, when we were thinking about dysphagia and their problems, um, what came uh, out more than just the medical part of dysphagia was um, the social emotional aspects of not being able to swallow properly and having these issues with eating. So for people who are suffering from dysphagia, this enjoyment around eating just isn't there. Instead, eating becomes scary, uncertain, and life-threatening. Um, I've heard stories of people who are you know, if they're eating alone, they have their cell phone beside them ready to dial an emergency number um, because of this fear of choking on their food um, and things like that. So eating isn't enjoyable for a lot of folks uh, who have dysphagia. What we know is that there's about 500 million people worldwide who are living with this problem. Um, and so when we think about those patients um, and what they're going through and, and this fear of eating, it's, you know, what is that all about? So basically, as I mentioned, it's one of the things is just fear of choking. And so there's two ways for food to go, either down into the, your esophagus and stomach or into the airway. Um, now, what we know is that when we get food or liquids um, into the airway, there's this risk of aspiration pneumonia. And for people who are hospitalized with it, there's a 25% chance of dying from it when you're in the hospital. Um, you know, so it's obviously it's a very concerning condition. Um, you can get a feeding tube to work around some of the problems if you aren't able to eat by mouth. But what we know about that is that it doesn't resolve this situation of aspiration. You can still have reflux and um, with the feeding tube and you can aspirate that into your lungs. So when we look at, at aspiration pneumonia um, feeding tubes, we know that the cost to the health system is really high. It's about $300 billion every year globally that's spent on trying to manage these consequences. So when we look at the um, the definition of dysphagia, essentially, it can include any kind of bolus or consistency. So that means some patients may have trouble managing everything from liquids to solids. Um, some patients may do, do okay with a certain type of consistency, but not another. Um, we also know that it can happen anywhere along the pathway from the lips into the esophagus. Uh, so there can be disturbances, neurological, muscular, um, sensory, in that pathway that create an issue for patients there. And we also know that the signs and symptoms can be brought forward either by clinician or patient perception. So why does it happen? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, primarily, um, these are some of the big ones. So head and neck cancer, neurological causes, stroke and aging. Um, <clears throat> and what we know is that many of these patients who have this are gonna be treated in community settings for um, both their dental and rehabilitation needs. And we also know that patients in any of these categories above are at risk for what we call a triple toxicity with this condition or the condition that they have. And that triple toxicity is physical, financial, and psychosocial problems. 
Now, <clears throat> we know that the prevalence of one of the physical problems, swallowing, is really high and that it can climb as time goes on. So it, it can become um, a chronic issue for patients. Um, so when we think about this group of patients, obviously, we really want to manage this dysphagia um, and address it. <clears throat> so before we get to that, though, let's talk a little bit about how this can present um, in a dental practice to you. So of course, as I mentioned, the prevalence of dysphagia is high. Um, the uh, statistics are that in the general population, about 16 to 23% of patients have dysphagia. And as you age, the um, uh, prevalence increases. So it increases in, to about 35% in patients who are over 76 years old. And that's just from normal aging um, with the swallowing muscles being like any other muscle in the body. <clears throat> you can see in this slide that, um, uh, you know, the, the top, uh, the up to range of prevalence in some of these disorders is extremely high. So head and neck cancer, up to 80% of patients will experience dysphagia, um, or sorry, for stroke. Um, head and neck cancer, 50%. Uh, folks who have, um, are in long-term care, um, the prevalence is quite high. And if you add dementia on top of that, it becomes even more high. Parkinson's disease, which is um, increasing in prevalence, also has a really high rate of dysphagia, especially in the later stages. And it is there in the earlier stages and is often um, unrecognized by the, the patient that they're uh, experiencing dysphagia. So it's, it's unknown to them. So if you think about your practice, you probably can think of many of many patients who have walked into your practice with one of these issues, um, if not just simply aging. So then I'm going to take it a little bit to um, talk about implants. And, and the reason for this is um, a bit of my related to my background, which was working in the Institute for Reconstructive Sciences and Medicine, where a large part of what was done there was um, uh, around implant retained prostheses. And generally, if we look at where the world of prosthodontic, even general prosthodontic treatment is going, um, implants are, are gaining speed at a, at a rapid rate. So, but when they first came out almost 35 years ago, there was an attempt made to answer the question, who's going to treat patients with implants? And as you can see in this initial report that oral surgeons were predicted to be the ones who would treat patients across the board. And then periodontists and surgically cognizant general dentists said, it was said that they would treat some, but not all patients. And then general dentists and endodontists would be treating relatively simple cases. Now, what we know is that this prediction was fairly conservative and that really there's a whole range of um, professionals who are treating patients with implant treatment. Um, so regardless of who's treating the patient, um, the question that I would raise in your consciousness is, are straightforward patients really straightforward? So these patients who walk into your office um, who seem like, hey, this is a great candidate for an implant retained prosthesis, um, uh, it's a question that should be asked. And the reason being, when you think about um, the percentage of patients who could present to you with dysphagia, um, um, it becomes a, a bigger uh, issue at that point. So if we look at implants as being this focus for our discussion, um, what we know is that the global dental implant market is, um, was 4 billion in this year, and it's expected to reach 6 billion by 2029. So it's uh, definitely still a growing market and um, is predicted to continue to be a growing market. Now, why, why am I harping on implants? Um, because I think that for patients, a lot of patients who require implants for a prosthesis, to retain a prosthesis, are also some patients who would have, be at higher risk for dysphagia. Now, when we were looking at our patient population at um, the Institute, we were interested in understanding when they came to us, what was their reason for wanting implants? What, what was in their mind 
about what an implant retained prosthesis would do for them. And what we found when we used the uh, patient perceived change uh, assessment tool was that, and what this was, was we would ask them before they had treatment, we, it was open-ended, we'd say, okay, what are you expecting to get from this treatment? And, and they would verbalize what that was. Um, and what we found was that when we looked at categorizing the responses across patients was that one of the most common responses was around improved chewing. Um, so it's, I mean, that makes sense. Um, people want to get teeth back in their mouth. They want to be able to chew food. But again, we also have these issues where um, patients may not necessarily understand that chewing is not just about teeth, that it really is about what's happening with the musculature inside the mouth, especially the tongue. Um, and if you don't have great function there, uh, you may have some real issues when you do get, um, uh, especially an implant retained prosthesis that, that does give you the ability to um, really uh, uh, get into trouble essentially. So why do I say that? Well, when we looked at um, masticatory efficiency in, in our patients, again, these were patients who had a background of head and neck cancer. Um, and we looked at how were they able to chew foods uh, across different time periods. What we found was that, um, and we used this sieving test where we had a series of sieves and the sieves had different apertures um, in the mesh that was in the sieve. And um, they were graded from large to small. And what we found was that um, patients who were in this group uh, tended to have all of the particles fall on the sieve or, or get caught on the sieve that had the largest opening. So which meant that um, very few fine particles, there were very few fine particles. And what that means to us is that, okay, so we have patients who have dysphagia, they may not be able to control a bolus very well. We've now just given them an implant retained prosthesis that they're gonna be able to use to really go for it when they're eating. And um, we know that they aren't, um, that there be larger um, chunks of food that they will attempt to swallow. And, you know, in some of the other research here, um, in the same project, what we also understood was even though they had these um, larger chunks of food, the number of chewing strokes didn't change. So they weren't aware that um, they still had these bigger pieces of food um, compared to what we would see in the normal group. So they were um, swallowing essentially bigger chunks of food as well. All right, so why is this an issue? Well, if we have these bigger chunks of food, um, you know, we know that they can get put into the airway. So the first way that this is an issue is around laryngeal penetration. And this is where food can get stuck in the larynx, um, but it doesn't go past the vocal folds. And then they can be aspirating. Um, and this is where food actually passes below the level of the folds and goes into the lungs. And um, so for cases with um, an implant retained prosthesis, the prandial aspiration or aspiration during a meal is a really um, big issue uh, as well to consider. So silent aspiration, again, can present in the practice where there's no cough and it's not clinically suspected. Um, and so what we know is that, uh, for example, in the head and neck cancer population, 35% of patients will be aspirating. And of those, half of them are gonna be doing it silently. So the point of all this is to say that people who present in your practice, they may present with overt swallowing risks. So you may, they may know they have a swallowing problem. You may know they have a swallowing problem, but they also may um, present with covert swallowing risks where you don't know that this is happening. So what do we do about this? I think one of the first things is get a good assessment of, of dysphagia for patients when they um, come in with one of these pre-existing conditions, know what's happening, um, and also educate the patients so that they understand that when they get their prosthesis, um, it may not do what they, they 
think it's going to do for them as far as eating. Um, and then the other thing is um, get serious about rehabilitation. So to start this discussion, I want to look at how we can harness digital health um, around changing behavior and um, what it can do for rehabilitation. So we're in this digital health revolution. Um, and what we know is that we we can leverage digital health, not only to improve access for patients, but to connect to patients, to ensure that they, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing when they're at home. Um, we can give them some tailored care. But the other important thing is also the data that we get. Um, that data can be used to inform decisions about the individual patient's care, but it also can be collated to help make decisions on a, a bigger scale for patients. So this revolution is one that's been coming for a while and, and we're in the midst of it now. And when we look at um, health at home in particular, so this means people having these digital technologies at home, being able to access types of care at home, it's growing really fast. So um, it's growing at a rate of about 37% on a compound annual growth rate. Um, Compare that to the slide on digital implants where that was growing at about a rate of 7%. So, you know, we're, we're being thrust into this realm where patients are gonna be using um, these types of devices at home more and more. And uh, when we look at digital healthcare and understanding the rate of adoption, what we know is that in the past five years, the uptake has doubled. So, the estimates are that about 30% of the population are using some sort of health tracker. And so what's driving this? Well, the first thing is there's been a shift to really um, consumerism when it comes to health technology. So when we look at this, you know, there's some really common examples around this, like the Apple Watch or the Aura Ring. And we know that lots of people are using these to just get some sort of insights into their own health um, and health behaviors. So this demand from consumers, it's, um, it's just not young people either. So it really is um, across the board, including people who are moving into seniorhood. So the baby boomer generation, which is just now approaching that era. Um, and they are wanting to be able to age in place. And the other thing that has really boosted this whole area rapidly has been um, a changed delivery model for health with what's happened with COVID and um, globally over the past two years. Now we've got this demand that's growing for these digital health technologies and that's really nice, but there has to be stickiness. There has to be something that makes us want to continue to use those technologies. Um, part of the answer to that is around the positive impact that a lot of them have on behavior. So this um, survey from Deloitte asked patients, how much has using a device changed your behavior? And 77% uh, of people reported that they felt the device really helped them to change their behavior. Interestingly, this holds across the board again into that baby boomer generation. And um, really with that generation being more savvy, assertive, they're health conscious and they're engaged in their health. So if we bring this now a little closer to home and, and look at the rehab domain, um, we've really seen an uptake in sensor-based home-based movement technologies by our physiotherapy colleagues. So in these examples that you see here with Hinge Health, Sword Health, Omada, all these patients um, are at home, they're wearing sensor-based technologies and they're doing their physio exercises while the clinician is virtual. So within the rehabilitation space, um, we're seeing a growth in these types of technologies as well. And it's not only changing patients' behavior, but it's also empowering patients. So what we're finding is that patients are using their own track data to enhance their ability to make decisions. Um, the ownership of that data enables them to have meaningful conversations with their caregivers, their medical um, professionals. And uh, again, the research by Deloitte that I had shown before also said that 
you know, older folks are willing to be more assertive in their care, even more than younger folks. So um, they're willing to go to their doctor and say, hey, this is what I saw and this is what I think and, and um, uh, take control of their, of their health. Um, it leads people to engage in healthy behaviors and then it creates this circle where knowledge is empowerment and then empowerment drives action. So all of these things, this problem with dysphagia, especially for folks who have these conditions and who are seeking um, treatment uh, within the Institute, um, it led us to say, okay, we need something that is going to speak to rehabilitating dysphagia in a different way. So this brings me to the part of the presentation where I'll talk about mobility. Um, and where that name came from was really around our desire to provide the patients a mobile therapist. And so when we looked at how we were treating patients for dysphagia, we had some options in front of us. We could put a tube in, we could modify their diet, usually by blending it into um, a, a consistency that they could drink. Um, there are compensatory movements. We can get them to position their head a certain way to try to prevent things from going down into the lungs. Oral care is super important. Um, even if a patient can't swallow food, if uh, they are aspirating saliva and if that saliva is um, dirty from the mouth, it's a really big problem as well. So oral care is another way that we can um, look at preventing some of these consequences. Transferring their care to home, um, giving them um, uh, knowledge about what, what is dysphagia and what they're gonna be doing at home. But what we really settled on was rehabilitation. And that meant to us a lot of exercise. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's all around having the musculature work the proper way um, for patients to be able to swallow safely. So the technology that we settled on was um, called EMG or electromyography. And why we did that was because there was foundational literature to support its use. And what we knew was that we could pick up signals. So what EMG does is it picks up signals from muscle contraction. And those signals can be visualized. They can be turned into a waveform like what you see on the screen here to give patients feedback about what those muscles are doing. So again, there's been validation of this technology. It was discovered as early as 1666 in, um, in an electric ray fish. Um, so that idea that you're able to detect a contraction was known as far back as then. Um, and its application to dysphagia, the first report of that was in the mid 70s. What we know through all these years um, from meta analyses is that when we pair the exercises that we have, that we prescribe to patients with biofeedback, EMG biofeedback, we know that um, it's more effective in improving their outcomes. So here's where we were. This is how our journey started into this mobile technology. Um, I'm gonna take you back to 2005. This is a picture from my lab at the Institute and this is a clinical trial story. So at that time, I really loved the concept of intensive exercise and it was just starting to become a really important thing um, for rehabilitation. And it wasn't yet being applied to dysphagia. And so I had this real burn to get our patients into an intensive exercise program using biofeedback. So I started this trial. It meant that they'd have to come into the clinic every day for weeks on end. And um, if you can imagine, it, it didn't work. And, the re and I had to close the trial because there was such low enrollment. And the reason was that it was just way too impractical to expect patients to be able to drive into the clinic every single day to get this done um, and get plugged into this machine here that you see. Um, this was the machine that we used to give biofeedback. And <clears throat> so for patients, it was costly, it was inconvenient. Um, and so they, they just weren't willing to do this. What we know in clinics is that this equipment is also costly. It's designed for one clinician to one patient. Um, so it's not very efficient. So what ends up happening with these patients is that 
um, it's become really status quo to just give them exercises that are written on a piece of paper. And if you've ever been in that situation, you probably know what ends up happening. You might do them for a day or two, then the piece of paper sits somewhere and then it gets lost and, and um, really adherence uh, to exercises of any kind that are prescribed this way is quite low. So if you compare what you just saw in that picture to this, where you see this woman using the mobility, she's in the comfort of her own home. Um, what the team did at True Angle was we took that big machine that you saw and we compacted it into this smart, easy to use system. And really what it does is it empowers patients um, to unlock their own potential and to be able to do this at home um, at their convenience. So in this picture, you can see this woman has a device under her chin. Um, she's looking at her phone and she's getting her exercise program delivered through an app on her phone. So again, as I mentioned, what this solution does is it targets the swallowing muscles. So the muscles that are under the chin, the submandibular muscles are um, the uh, muscles that start the chain for swallowing. They're also the muscles that um, are attached to the larynx. And so their contraction pulls the larynx up and forward, thereby opening the esophagus and providing a safer passage of food. So the intention is for patients to go through this exercise program. You can see that there's a target on the screen. That target is meant for the patient to, depending on the exercise, um, hit or exceed, and then stay above it again, depending on the exercise for a prescribed amount of time. Um, and these targets are personalized and they're progressive for the patients. So essentially it's a two part system. There's that patient part. Uh, there's also a provider part. So for clinicians who are working in a clinic, they can use this to show patients exactly what they need to do for their exercise. And if they're doing that exercise the right way, they have a clinician portal. So for the first time ever, we're able to um, see exactly how the patient is adhering to their exercise. So every single muscle contraction is recorded. Um, we can see what days they exercised. We can see um, how much they did, and we can see how many of the targets that they hit. Uh, again, this is something that we've never had before. The best that we had was uh, patient diaries where they, they were saying that, yeah, I did the exercises and, and it was just on good faith that you um, believed it. So again, um, the patients at home doing this, that information is getting fed to the clinician. Um, for patients, because not everybody's at the same level, the exercises are personalized based on the muscle contraction that the particular patient can generate. Um, they're given progress trackers. And so it takes them through this program that motivates them to continue to uh, meet and beat their targets. So here's what we're hearing from patients. Um, this was from a patient who in the US who'd been treated for head and neck cancer. She hadn't eaten anything for nine months. She was really desperate to eat again. Her clinician got her using the mobility. And what was interesting about this case was if we look at that circle of empowerment that I talked about before with empowering patients, enhancing what they know, enabling them and engaging them, what uh, from her viewpoint, the empowerment came that she could use this on her own time um, whenever she wanted and how it enhanced her um, health was that she used it to make decisions. Uh, so what she saw was that when she was doing this, she was more successful at hitting her exercise targets when she exercised in the morning and she was trying to transition off a tube. So she was eating one meal a day by mouth um, or attempting to. She had been doing that in the evening. So when she started seeing the relationship between when she was more successful with exercising, um, it became apparent that she was stronger in the morning. That's when she started to um, uh, do that one meal a day in the morning instead of the evening and was able to get more success that way. So it really enabled her to make a decision that was right for her. Um, and then of course the engagement was just that accelerated success led to continued engagement uh, from her. 
when we look at what we're hearing from clinicians um, and, and having been in this position myself, what I know from trying to teach these exercises is that it's really tough. It's, you know, teaching someone how to swallow. It's not something we ever think about. We can't see those muscles. We can't see them contract like a bicep. Um, so getting patients to, um, knowing that we were teaching them and they were doing it the right way was hard. Um, in fact, there's some research that's in press right now. It's not ours. It's a colleague who, um, you know, the, the number, the percentage of patients who are doing exercises the right way without biofeedback is really low. It's below 20%. When we give them biofeedback with EMG, it, it goes up to almost hundred percent. So we know that um, it does make a difference in the quality of exercise that patients are doing. Um, also, as a clinician, to see patients one-on-one -on -one and sit with them while they go through an exercise program is time-consuming. So we didn't have time to see all the patients that, that we wanted to. Um, this really allows patients to do that on their own time. There's no reason as a clinician that I have to be sitting right beside them. And of course, this other issue um, that, that we're hearing from other clinicians, patients just don't want to commute every single day to do this kind of thing. Um, and so when clinicians are using it, they are, patients are saying, oh my gosh, I finally get what you want me to do when they get that visual. Um, so it's been uh, very successful and transitioning patients to home with this, letting them have it at home has also been a big um, uh, benefit. So just really quickly, a little bit about the research that went into this. Um, there was research around design and development, around the feasibility of using this technology, and then also the economics of it. So when we first started this project, it was at the university. Um, it was funded by one of our local cancer uh, foundations. It was a five-year grant, $2 million over five years. And um, it was really about developing the technology. So getting it from that big machine into this compact system. So it started with understanding what's out there. Um, then it also went to consider who are we designing this for? Well, patients and clinicians. So we really gathered information from them. Um, we worked to understand what kind of electronics should we be using? What kind of sensors should we be using? Uh, so we spent time in that area. We also looked at what do patients want in an app? You know, I had this really young energetic team who wanted a game. Um, and when we presented this to patients and we presented these different concepts about what would you like to see when you're doing these exercises, what they said to us was, um, I don't want a game. I want something really simple. It's so hard for me to swallow that I just have to focus on doing it right. Um, and especially within the head and neck cancer realm, um, a lot of them are really exhausted. They don't need an extra cognitive load. Some are still on, um, you know, heavy doses of uh, painkillers and that. So it had to be simple. Um, we also spent lots of time looking, I know it sounds crazy, but at adhesives, it was a big issue for us to understand how we would um, safely uh, and gently secure the device uh, to a patient. We then got into looking at algorithms, and um, this is still a, a point of research for us. How can we make swallow detection even smarter than what it is right now and, and bringing in concepts and machine learning? Um, then once we had a, a minimal viable product, we needed to know that we could navigate the system, but could patients. So we started getting into usability studies, um, and that was both with patients who have head and neck cancer and uh, neurological conditions like stroke. Once we were through that, we then went into feasibility studies where we gave patients the, um, the product, they could take it home, and they were to use it for six weeks. And what we found was really exciting, especially with adherence. Um, we had a high percentage, so 78% of our patients were adhering to 100% of their exercises. So that meant exercising every day, seven days a week, um, through a full um, uh, 72 swallow-based exercise program. Now, when we look in the literature um, and we look at that high rate of adherence, 
or um, to exercises, what we know is that only about 22% of patients say that they are highly adherent. So um, the technology definitely does something to motivate patients. Our research also showed that um, patients were reporting after they went through the therapy that it was easier to swallow, they were coughing less, they're less embarrassed and less upset by their problem. So just a little bit on the economics of this. So we've done some early economic modeling where we compared mobility to conventional in-clinic therapy. We use secondary data sources for this. Um, and this was done by the Institute for Health Economics. And what we estimated was that a payer could save between $1,600 and $3,200 per year per patient. And this was by... Um, if they adhered to an intensive exercise program by preventing the unwanted consequences of dysphagia, like aspiration, pneumonia, and G-tubes. So um, this is something that we are continuing to study in um, real world settings. So this started a decade ago at the U of A. Um, in 2017, I spun out the company True Angle from the University of Alberta. The team's been together since then. Um, Dylan is our chief technical officer. He's a really his superpower is around miniaturizing technology and and Gabby who did her PhD um, uh, in the project when we were at the U of A. She really is um, a, a master at focusing on the customer and what's important to them and what makes a product work for them. So we launched in the US in uh, of all years 2020. Um, and since then have been um, uh, selling into the US market. We've built a strong team around us and, and brought some advisors in to help us with our lean product development and ensuring that we're delivering quality products and growing the company. So it's been a, a really fun ride um, uh, moving this from way back when we started at the Institute as a clinician scientist and um, moving a technology from a lab into the market. So I really appreciate this opportunity to share this with you. Um, thank you, Dr. Albashti for arranging this. And if there's time, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, might be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jenna. Um, we really uh, enjoy your inspiring um, presentation. It's really uh, uh, focused to move the, the research to the real uh, uh, product for the patients that can be used at, um, at home. So uh, once again, I really thank you for uh, this really inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, you uh, divided us to the uh, explaining the dysphagia and how uh, 500 million people are suffering from this um, issue, especially we know that food is uh, a very important uh, 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 meal that we all together comes and, and have it together. But with uh, such disorder, it's difficult for some people to be uh, uh, together and uh, enjoying their their meal. So uh, then you moved us to the uh, possibilities that can those uh, uh, patient have through the uh, traditional way of treatment. And then uh, you explained it to us in logical way how your technology and developed technology is improving and enhancing the ability for those patients to um, enhance um, their uh, functional regarding the uh, dysphagia. So we really enjoy it. So um, I think we have one question. So, uh, and uh, again, you raised the, uh, and you connected the implants um, uh, to mm -hmm. the dysphagia. So um, the, the question is, um, I always want to know if advisable to do implants on diabetics patients. Um, I don't know if it's related, but uh, you have the uh, right to answer it. So uh, did you say diabetic patients? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, 
I'm not certain um, that I can answer the question from, you know, the medical aspect of implants being um, placed in patients with diabetes. Maybe that question is coming from thoughts about um, blood flow in the jaws and that type of thing. I know that was always a big um, concern for us when we were dealing with patients who had radiation to that area. Um, so I certainly couldn't um, couldn't answer that that medical aspect of it. Um, with respect to diabetes and, and dysphagia, um, while people with diabetes have to um, obviously alter their diets um, to manage their blood sugar, it's uh, not um, a, a disorder where we commonly see dysphagia associated with it, unless the diabetes has led to another um, morbidity, so like a stroke um, or something like that, where then there is dysphagia. So, um, you know, I, I think that's as much as I could offer for around that question. Um, yeah, it's uh, very understandable. Um, Jenna, just I need to ask you, because you have been through um, a very long um, academia uh, career and uh, mm -hmm. clinician as well. And you shifting, it's, um, I'm not sure if it's the right word, it's suddenly shifting to the technology and mm. starting a, a company. How was uh, challenge, challenging for you to, to, to shift to that direction? Can you um, Mahmoud, I, I love this question. <laughs> um, it's a great one because it's, you know, I, I think that here's the thing wonderful innovations are born out of academia, right? And especially clinical academia, because I think, you know, having been a clinician scientist, we're in touch with what's happening in that particular population. We're so easily able to identify the real, um, uh, what we would call pain points that we're experiencing in a clinic. And, um, you know, if you have an innovative group around you to be able to start to solve some of those, it's, it's this amazing combination. So, so I, I think some of the, the, the most innovative ideas come out of academia. However, I think many of them stay inside a lab or they get shelved because sometimes the support that is necessary to get you to move or, or to get an idea out of your lab just might not be there. So, or you may not be interested in it, right? So to make that jump into entrepreneurship, you have to have a, a there has to be a certain mindset around it. So I know for me, um, it might seem like it was a sudden jump, but it was a bit of a, you know, it was a slow process. I could see that we had this five-year grant. I could see that there were things coming down the road that that research grant wasn't going to be able to pay for. So in my case, that was a patent. It was like, oh, we have to, we have to pay for these patents and this grant isn't going to pay for it. So somehow if I really feel that there's something behind this innovation and, and one day want to commercialize it, we have to protect this patent. So that was kind of the start. So I, that actually was what prompted me to spin out the company because I, I thought, okay, I have to figure out now how to get money for doing this. And, and it's interesting because as academics, we're, we learn over our careers how to get money. We, through grants and, you know, we get the rejections and eventually we get money after probably many, many applications. So we're well groomed to find money, but um, I had to find it in a different way now. Um, so and also I needed that support to, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I, I knew how to start a company. I knew how to go to the, the office, the government office and create a corporation, but <laughs> that's just the beginning, right? So for me, where, where things really switched was there was um, this group called the Creative Destruction Lab. And um, it's a global accelerator. Um, it's it started in Canada, but it's it's moving globally. I believe there's a location in Paris, actually. Um, and what they do is they take these ideas that um, come out from academic units, and they they really nurture the folks who are in there to have an entrepreneurial mindset. And that shifted everything, 
the, the, the amount of, of information, what we learned in that, it was a nine month program was phenomenal. And so then the road became clearer of how this was going to have to happen. Um, now in the, in more recent years here for us in, in our environment, um, there are many more university-based commercialization initiatives that really help folks who have these ideas starting at, at a very young age. And I think we need more of that in our academic institutions, kind of that grooming and the guidance of how to get someone from a lab into commercialization if they really want to do that. Um, so, but I, I can tell you, it hasn't been without its, its hiccups. I mean, you know, as an example, um, I just love being asked to do this presentation. We've been uninvited from doing presentations, um, scientific presentations on our research when, um, when it was became apparent that there's a company associated with this. So, you know, I went from a place of, of being able to present research, being respected for that research, to a place where it's like, well, now there's a company involved. So, um, you know, it brings in a whole other set of challenges when it comes to research. Um, I feel very fortunate that I'm at a university that really values innovation. So they're very supportive of what we're doing um, and have um, some systems around us. So um, it's been a journey for certain. It was one where, again, I think that having good people around who can help you, um, you know, the question went through my mind when I was getting into this early on, do I need an MBA to do this? Quite honestly, I think the real world is that's where you learn, you get your kicks and, and uh, your learnings uh, when you're actually out there doing this. And so, um, but it's been, for me, it's been this amazing way to tie together something that I love so much from a clinical research perspective and actually getting it um, out into the world and now getting real world evidence that we can do research with. So, I mean, it's, it's a different type of research, but it's, it's really exciting. So I think for anybody who has an inkling um, to do this, uh, it's, it's a little scary, but step out, do it, find the right people to support you. Um, and it's, it'll be one of the funnest rides that, uh, that you'll get on. Very, very great. Um, I think um, one of the most key for that, if you love something, so you will be pioneer in that one. And um, I can see when you are talking, you really love what you are doing uh, now with the uh, mobility team and uh, the work that you are uh, doing. So I will um, move to the other aspect and I need you to talk a little bit and touch on that leadership. Mm. How, how, <laughs> I know it's leadership in academia or clean, on, on the clinical setting is, is a little bit different when you uh, see EO on a company. So mm. can you touch on that? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you, Mahmoud, you probably know a bit of the history. Uh, again, I was part of the Institute for Reconstructive Sciences and Medicine and the founder of that institute, well, there were co-founders, um, uh, Dr. Gordon Wilkes and Dr. John Wolfart. Um, and um, really, uh, they were amazing leaders. And, and I learned a lot, especially from Dr. Wolfart um, about leadership styles, about mentorship, um, and so I feel fortunate that I had that experience. Um, I, I had the experience of leading a laboratory team. Um, but I have to say now the experience of, of leading a team, our team right now, as you can see, there's um, uh, 14 of us and it's in a business. And so one of the things that's been interesting in, in that a lot of the things of, of, about leadership from academia apply to business, but there are some things that don't. So for example, um, one, the speed with which things have to get done. It has, in a business, you don't have the luxury that we experience a lot of times in academia. Things have to go fast. Um, you know, I'm, 
I was out raising money for the company um, in, in terms of investment. And that had to happen in three months. Whereas you think about the long road of getting a grant and you know the slowness of that product development, what we learned for our, from our customers, changing that. All those things have to happen really rapidly. And um, some of the people on the team are also from academia. So we all had to learn how to you know, be not so perfect and just get it done. Um, the, the other thing is, um, you know, what I would describe as a roller coaster of a startup, any startup, if, if you're told even that Google as a startup was like, whoo, smooth sailing, um, they're lying. Uh, and, and even the folks, uh, you know, I was at a, uh, an event in California for the plug and play accelerator where Google came out of. Um, and they had some folks there talking about the early days and you know, they talk about the things that you don't see behind the scenes. So, and those are these things, this very roller coaster type of ride. So you've got a team that you're leading through sometimes really murky waters as you're trying to um, find that product market fit uh, and um, dealing with different health systems, et cetera. There's lots of challenges. And so I think just um, instilling in, and not everything's going to go perfectly. And there will be, uh, you know, I don't really like this word, but I don't know another one to use. There'll be mistakes made. And the thing is, um, how do we use those and be okay with them and learn from them? And again, do that quickly. So I think um, those are the things as a leader of, a, of a, a business team that I've learned are quite different as well as, um, you know, I had some grooming around this with processes because RSM was um, an institute that had an ISO system. So very familiar with having processes, but again, seeing how important those are for team function, right? So they're, they're processes that relate to what you're making or doing, but they also are, pro when those are in place and people know what they should be doing, your team can also function much better. So, um, so I, I think those are some of the ways that, um, that I've found that leadership within a business is a little different than say leading a lab or, or something within academia. Thank you so much, um, Jenna. Um, yes, um, I think uh, digital technologies is um, around us and moving the digital technologies to be more um, uh, in whom with the patient, that is very, very important, especially when we talk about um, hidden neck cancer patients um, because they are suffering, they, uh, uh, they have a lot of issues and mm -hmm. as you mentioned, it's very difficult to them to come to the clinic. Uh, many, many other challenges that facing uh, uh, them. So I believe uh, the technology is uh, helping uh, them and helping us to provide them with the right rehabilitation uh, uh, process for them. So uh, uh, check if we have, I think there is no more questions. So, uh, uh, we are going to conclude the uh, decision. So uh, Jenna, I really would like to thank you for your time and effort to be with us today. You shared with us your experience, a very, very long experience through the academia and the clinical work and then on the technology and innovative technologies and the uh, interpreter uh, uh, sessions that you um, and the company that you started. So uh, I really would like would like to thank you for everything. And uh, we have tradition um, that uh, we would like to uh, present you a certificate of appreciation. So we hereby express our sincere um, appreciation to Professor Jenna Rieger in recognition of her contribution as a live webinar speaker for the Digital Dontics webinar series on the topic of mobility, uh, mobility T, a wearable digital health technology or swallowing disorder that was presented on uh, Thursday, July 21st, 2022. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. You're welcome, Amud. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. I wish um, have a lovely day. And um, for all the uh, attendees, I would like to thank you for uh, joining us today for this uh, very valuable uh, lecture from uh, Professor Jenna Rieger. And uh, I will take this opportunity to invite you to attend the upcoming webinars that focus on digital dentistry. Uh, I'm sure you will uh, get more information about uh, those technologies. So please don't hesitate to uh, come back again to the other webinars. Jenna, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.